Uh, it's nice to be here. Uh, the good news is I don't have any speech, so relax. It's just pictures. I don't have one bar graph, one pie chart, nothing. Uh, <laughs> these pictures are what I do for a living in Pittsburgh. And uh, they've got me into some interesting places over the years. And um, uh, we'll try to run through this pretty quickly. I think we have, what, a half hour or so? Okay. Um, but it's also my autobiography. I've only had two jobs my entire life running the center I'm going to show you guys, but I also used to fly jets for a living. I flew 727s for an outfit called Braniff Airlines. Um, great idea, wrong airline. Uh, <laughs> but it was a good ride. I met some great guys, and it allowed me to figure out that the work I'm now doing was the work that I wanted to do, not that I had to do. That it gave me the competitive advantage of... Um, thinking of myself as an airline captain who elected to spend his life working with poor people. Because, unfortunately, in poor communities, you don't have a tendency to get the best leadership. You have a tendency to get the worst leadership. And unfortunately, if that's the case, the problems become so intractable that they become insoluble. So I've developed a different approach to this thing. Uh, I've decided that if I'm going to sort of mortgage my life to do this work, we're going to do it right, and we're going to get this problem solved. So what I do uh, is run a vocational school and an arts program called Manchester Craftsman's Guild and Bidwell Training Center. It's my autobiography, once upon a time, public school kid. I went to the Pittsburgh public school system, and um, an art teacher actually saved my life. His name was Frank Ross. Uh, it was one of those almost prophetic moments where I was passing by the art room door in our high school. The art room door was open. We had a potter's wheel. The guy was an artist. He made this great big old bowl. I had never seen ceramics then. It was like magic. And I was standing at the art room door, and he turned around and says, can I help you? I said, well, what is that, man? That's cool. He said, well, that's ceramics. I said, well, I want you to teach me how to do that. He says, well, get your homeroom teacher to sign a piece of paper that says you can come in. You're good to go. So for the remaining two years of high school, I cut all of my classes and I went to the art room. But I was smart enough to give the classes to the teachers I was cutting, and they gave, I gave them pottery, and they gave me passing grades. And that's how I got out of the place. And Frank says, you're too smart to die. I don't want it on my conscience. I'm leaving this school, um, and you're going with me. And Frank drove me out to the um, University of Pittsburgh down the street, and he had me fill out a college application, which I did in pencil. And I got in on probation because not one time in my high school did anybody ever show us the scholastic aptitude test. So I never saw the test. So I took the test, didn't do very good on the test. But Pitt took a chance on me and they let me in on probation. Well, not only did I graduate from the place, I'm now a trustee of the place. I actually sit on the board of the school that let me in on probation. And I was the commencement speaker down at Mellon Arena, 13,000 people. And I'd get up and said, don't give up on the poor kids. They might end up being the commencement speaker someday. <laughs> And basically, to the extent that I have a story to tell you, that's the story. I think that people are born into the world as assets, not liabilities. It's all in the way that you treat people that drives performance. So based on my autobiography, uh, which now includes uh, 14 honorary PhDs, including Carnegie Mellon, the MacArthur Fellowship, an airline captain's rating, and I lecture at the Harvard Business School, and now I can add Tepper, and Stanford, and Kellogg, and Amos Tuck, and Oxford, all from a public school kid that got into the university on probation. So don't give up on the poor kids. Uh, they could do some extraordinary things if you believe in them. So in the 60s, before most of you were born, I suspect, how many of you were even around in the 60s? Raise your hand. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did the presentation one time. Nobody raised a hand. Well, I was around during the riots in Pittsburgh, and people were getting shot on the streets. I wanted to help. So I knew something about ceramics, so I founded Manchester Craftsman's Guild to work with kids from the Pittsburgh public school system teaching clay to these kids. And I started hearing back that whatever I was doing with these kids, they were starting to show up at school more regularly. After a couple of years, I figured it out. There wasn't anything wrong with the kids. The school system was the problem. The kids were fine. They needed enough clay and enough enthusiasm you could cure what was troubling them. Bidwell, on the other hand, 
was this really funky dunky poverty program, and the guys who built it screwed it up pretty good, and they were looking for some fool to take it over. They said, well, there's that Bill Strickland up the street. He thinks he's Moses. He'd probably take the job. <laughs> and back then, I did think I was Moses, could lead all the poor to the promised land and all that. So I took over Bidwell in 1972 in a warehouse with holes in the floor and holes in the roof. And my first day on the job, the kids were gambling on their knees at the front door of the place. No windows, front door on a hinge. And I looked at these kids gambling, and I walked into my office, and I sat down at the end of the first day. I said to my secretary, I said, Miss Jones, when I showed up here today, the kids were gambling on their knees at the front door. I think I'm pretty street hip. I didn't recognize the game the kids were playing. She said, oh, they were taking bets on how long you last. <laughs> so that was Bidwell, man. And the SWAT team was in and out of that place every other week throwing guys up against the wall. Nobody in the right mind uh, would have taken the job. But it's the 60s, you know, I could save mankind and all that. So my first official act at Bidwell, I bought the beer and I bought the paint. I said, anybody that doesn't show up to paint this building is fired. And one guy didn't show up and I fired him. And I said, we're not living like this. We're going to work our way out of this mess one step at a time. So that was the genesis of Bidwell. It's important for you to understand that or the story doesn't make any sense. So let me show you what I did with it from the 60s. Have y'all ever heard of a fellow named Frank Lloyd Wright? He did okay in the architecture business. And Mr. Ross took a bunch of us inner city kids to see a very famous house called Falling Water, just south of Pittsburgh. So here's this Italian guy. He's got these black kids in his van. You're going down through the woods, and you come out to this fabulous clearing, and there's this big house sitting up on a creek, over top of a creek. And I looked at that, and I said, man, in my neighborhood, we spend time trying to keep the water out of the house. This guy's got a creek running right down to the middle of the place. That's an interesting way of looking at water. The other thing that really fascinated me was the quality of the light that enveloped the house. I said, if I can get that light into my neighborhood, I'm halfway home. So I committed myself to building a Frank Lloyd Wright building before I left the planet, and I did. I'm going to show it to you, because I hired one of his students to build my training center on the north side of Pittsburgh, and that's the building we built. This is our concept of how to build training centers for poor people. Um, one of the worst parts about being poor is what it does to your spirit. Poor people never have a nice day. They also don't notice that the sun comes up anymore because they don't have any reason to look at it. So the whole theory of my center is, if you want to work with people who have been left aside, you have to look like the solution and not the problem. So I built this building for welfare mothers and at-risk kids and former steel workers. Because the worst part of being, being poor, it kills your spirit. If you kill people's spirit, you can't teach them anything. So I figured that out, so I built this center, it worked out pretty good. That's the entrance to the building. I'm a big believer in environment. If you don't remember anything else I said today, except that environment drives behavior, I've done my job. That's the one concept that we've built our whole philosophy around, is environment. We have a beautiful environment. The place is flooded with sunlight. Pittsburgh, of course, as you know, is gray from November to May. But even on a gray day, the building is flooded with sunlight. Why? Because poor people are always in the dark in their heads. So I wanted to get them out of the dark and put them out in sunlight and let them know that the sun's for everybody on the planet, not just for rich people. We have fabulous artwork throughout the building. It's all my taste, because I raised all the money. I said to my board, when y'all raise the money, we'll put your taste on the wall. <laughs> but we have quilts and clay and calligraphy, and every way I turn to something beautiful looking back at you, that's quite deliberate. I can also tell you, in 24 years of operation in this Frank Lloyd Wright building, We've never had one act of graffiti, no violence, no drugs, no alcohol, no police calls. Zero in 24 years. Now, when y'all come over to visit, if I have time, I'll take you to see my old high school. It's still there, four blocks away. Steel doors, metal detectors, cameras, and bars in the window. Four blocks from this Frank Lloyd Wright building. Now, there are two possibilities. The kids genetically alter themselves in four blocks, <coughs> Well, there's something about the way in which we've elected to treat these kids. And the point of the story is, people are a function of environment. You build schools with metal detectors and cameras, 
you should call them prisons instead of schools because they aren't schools. This is a school. Uh, I hired a Japanese cabinet maker to do 60 pieces of furniture for our school. And the way I hired this guy, I hired him from Kyoto, Japan. In the old days, a friend of mine went to Kyoto and married this guy and brought him back to Pittsburgh. And she called me up and said, I understand you were doing the building trades, which we were back then. She said, well, my husband's from Japan, and I was wondering if you'd give him a job teaching carpentry. I said, well, bring the guy over. I'll talk to him. Well, he didn't speak any English. And you can imagine how much Japanese I speak. So <laughs> she kind of interpreted for this guy. And I found out he had studied with George Nakashima, who was one of the great Japanese-American woodworkers. And I was hip to Nakashima. So I said, tell your husband I'm going to give him a job. And she did. And he told her in Japanese, please tell Mr. Strickland I'm very grateful for the job, but I apologize that my English is so poor. I said, well, tell your husband that the students he's going to work with don't speak English either, so they ought to get along fine. <laughs> and uh, I hired the guy, worked out pretty good, and we got 60 pieces out of it for our school. Now, we spun this guy off into his own business. He's got a year waiting list doing furniture for high net worth individuals in Pittsburgh, so it's worked out pretty good. We even have fresh flowers in the building every day. Not plastic, real. I don't want to offend anybody, but I am not a proponent of plastic flowers. <laughs> now that I'm getting to be a big shot, giving speeches at the Tepper School, I had a bunch of high school principals come over and visit my school. They said, man, Mr. Strickland, this place is fabulous. And we were really blown away by them flyers. We are curious how them flyers got there. So, well, I got in my car and I went out to the greenhouse and I bought them and I brought them back and I put them there. You don't need a task force or a study group to buy flowers for your kids. The children deserve fresh flowers in their life. The cost is incidental. The gesture is very significant. And the reason why I won the MacArthur Genius Fellowship is I figured out the cure for spiritual cancer. It's called sunlight and good food and flowers and environment and enthusiasm. You figure that out, you'll solve your problem. That's at Christmas time. And since you are associated with the Heinz School, I hope you all eat Heinz ketchup out here. Uh, if you don't, you ought to start. And I don't know where your politics are about ketchup, but I stand with ketchup. In the old, old days, I had a cardboard box built in my Frank Lloyd Wright building. I had it in a garbage bag. And I was dragging this bag all over Pittsburgh trying to get some money to build this school. So I got called into the office of United States Senator John Hines, who happened to be the heir to the Heinz ketchup fortune which was like going to see the Wizard of Oz, because he had about 600 million at the time, and I had about 60 cents. And he said, man, you've done a great job with the black folks and the at-risk kids and the ex-steel workers, and we understand you want to build a new school. I said, I do. He said, well, you could really help the Heinz Company's affirmative action goals out if you'd uh, build a culinary program in your new school. That way, we could hire some black folks for the Heinz Company and solve our affirmative action problem. Well, we were a building trades program back then. I said, Senator, I'm really reluctant to go into a field I don't know anything about. But I promise you, if you'll help me get this center built, I'll come back in a couple years, and we'll get that food program going just like you asked. And he sat real quietly. He said, well, what would your answer be if I said I'd give you a million dollars? I said, Senator, it appears that we're going into the food training business. <laughs> uh, and, and John Hines did give me a million bucks. But as importantly, he loaned me the head of research for the Heinz Company. And we borrowed the curriculum from the Culinary Institute of America. And we created a gourmet cooks program for welfare mothers in this million dollar kitchen. And we've never looked back. It's been a great ride. Now, we lost John Hines to a plane accident, as you all know. He would have been giving the keys to President elect Obama, in my judgment. Uh, he was a very good man. When you come over, you'll feel his spirit at the front door of my center. This center is a demonstration of the power of John Hines and his extraordinary personality. Uh, we built an amphitheater for the students, throw in uniform. Now, we don't train chefs, we train gourmet cooks, but done to a gourmet standard. Our guys work at private clubs and country clubs and institutional cooking. No fast food is ever done at that facility. It's all gourmet, and we serve it to the students every day. Why? because it's tough to teach people when they're hungry. So the answer is give them something to eat. But we don't do fast food, we do gourmet food. So the idea was that I wanted to take the stigma out of food. Good foods for everybody on the planet, not just for rich people. And if people tell you that you can't serve gourmet food in a public school system, 
you send them to my center. I've been doing it for 22 years. You just have to want to do it bad enough. Now, eight years ago, a bunch of middle school people, kids, called a press conference to protest the food that they were being served in the public school. None of our students have ever had a press conference about our food. Uh, that's our pastry department. We took the design from a Ritz-Carlton hotel and we built it. I uh, even got the black folks and the white folks eating together voluntarily without giving the civil <laughs> rights speech. What we discovered is if you build world-class training centers, people have a tendency to see themselves as the same. You build prisons, they act like prisoners. So we got that problem figured out. This is in celebration of a salmon. I caught Lake Michigan and brought back to Pittsburgh. So I had all these fish in these coolers. I'm thinking, what am I going to do with all this fish? Have a party. So I gave the fish to the culinary department. We did our version of a fish fry, which was smoked salmon and salmon with grab locks and salmon with crab meat and three forks and three knives and ice sculpture. And I invited 100 of my corporate buddies to this fish fry. And one guy was so taken with the concept that the center gave us a check for $300,000. One salmon, $300,000. <laughs> Calculate the return on investment for that one piece of salmon. So as you might suspect, we now do salmon presentations quite regularly at our school. This is the work the students are doing after six months. These are all the poor people who supposedly don't have any talent or any ability. Well, we've made a fascinating discovery about poor people. The only thing wrong with them, they don't have any money, which is a curable condition. It's all in the way that you think about people that drives behavior. That's all pastry. I actually sat down and ate an old basket one time. It was very good. <laughs> <laughs> this is our dining room. We do a lot of black tie functions at the school. We call it cross-marketing. This is the image that I want to put into your head about how the inner city should look in every city in this country and then eventually around the world. Uh, we train pharmaceutical technicians for the pharmacy industry. Uh, we have pharmaceutical technicians with no background in science, competent to serve in retail and wholesale pharmaceutical facilities in less than 12 months with no background in science. Also trained technicians for uh, Bayer, Calgon Carbon, Nova Chemical, Alcoa, PPG. When you come visit, I'll show you welfare moms doing analytical chemical applications in less than 12 months with no background in science. Why? Because environment drives performance. You build world-class environments, you get world-class performance. Now, if I have figured out a way to take welfare mothers with no background in science and they're performing in a sophisticated enough way to go to work in research facilities, why is this country losing its ground to the quality of its workforce for the rest of the world? It doesn't make any sense. So what I'd like to propose to all of you is that we take all these liabilities called poor people and turn them into assets and make them productive citizens and solve this thing. Because I can figure it out in Pittsburgh, there's no reason why we're living like this. We even teach people how to read. I have students in the program with high school diplomas that they can't read. Not one of them, I got a lot of them. Now, as sure as I'm standing at this podium, this country, which we all love so much, is gonna be unrecognizable in about 30 years that we don't stop this hemorrhaging. The dropout rate for black and Hispanic youth in America is now 50%. You know what that's called? A tsunami that's going to bury this country. And we've got to turn this thing around. And I think you guys are a big part of the solution to this. That's why I came out here to talk to you. That's our library, more of our handcrafted furniture. And this is the arts program. Remember I'm the black guy from the 60s making pottery? Well, I'm still doing it, just on a much bigger scale. And the way this thing came into existence is the bishop of the Episcopal Diocese took a liking to me. His name was Robert Appleyard. He, out, he used to give me checks out of the bishop's discretionary fund. That's how I got started. He gave me an old row house. My dad and I fixed it up. I built a kiln out back and started dragging kids in off the street to save their souls with clay. I'm still doing it just on a much bigger scale. So I was actually mentored by a white Episcopal bishop uh, who was an extraordinary man and who I love very much. And he died of prostate cancer. And his wife asked me to speak at his memorial service, which I did. 
And I got up, and before I stood, she gave, took my hand, and she said, I want you to understand that the bishop cried like a baby when he saw your name in the New York Times with your first presidential appointment. The point of the story is don't judge the book by the cover because you never know in what form your next friend's going to show up. So if you treat everybody the right way, it increases the likelihood something good's going to happen to you. The other thing that the bishop taught me before he died is that wherever there are Episcopalians, there's money in very close proximity. And I got the two wealthy Episcopal churches in Pittsburgh, St. Michael's, which is the Mellon Church, and Fox Chapel, to put up the money for this thing, and it's worked out pretty good. So nowadays, I have 500 kids from the Pittsburgh Public Schools. This is all kids', kids work, by the way. Oh, artistic aptitude, whatever that is, is not a requirement to get into the program. Any kid that scratches their head doing the presentations in the program. So get your mother sign a piece of paper that says you can get on a school bus and you're good to go. I lose 20% of the kids in the first 30 days when they discover it's not an adult daycare center. It's an arts program to save your life. But 90% of those kids went to college last year. And I've averaged 90, 91% for 17 years in a row. And we do not teach the academics. What we teach is motivation. You can't teach the kids algebra if they don't want to live. The first thing you've got to do is to get them to want to stay on the planet. And the arts appeals to the hemisphere of the brain when the human imagination lies. You unlock that, you unlock your performance. And so based on that understanding, I built this program to do that. So 92% of my kids went to college last year. Seven of my faculty are former kids. Went through the program, went to college, and are back teaching at the center that saved a life. And we have our first Fulbright scholar, first PhD, and an emergency room doc down at UPMC that came through our ceramics program. The arts is a bridge to walk across to a new life. Most of the kids don't become artists, don't care. The arts is a way of unlocking human potential. This is all kids' work. The kids did this for the school. We bring in nationally known artists from all over the world who mentor these kids. If you're a Pittsburgher, you know that photograph. That's down on Wood Street. The kid who took his picture is now working for Disney. He got a scholarship on that photograph. This is the gallery. This is the student show. This is my concept of how you're supposed to treat inner city kids. I even got their parents coming to the art openings. Fifteen years ago, we couldn't buy a parent. We'd have the art openings, and now the parents would show up. So one of my buddies got off into saving souls for Jesus, you know, dragging guys out of bars and all that kind of stuff. I said, I want you to come work for me. You've got to tone down the Jesus stuff, but keep the enthusiasm. Uh, I can't get the parents to come. He said, I'll get them to come. So he took the keys to the van and went to Miss Jones' house. I said, Miss Jones, I knew you wanted to come to your kids' art opening, but you probably didn't have a ride. So I came to give you a ride. We got 20 parents and 30 parents. The last show, 200 parents. And not one parent was picked up by our center. Why? Because people talk about you if you don't support your kids at the Manchester Craftsman's Guild because they think you're a bad parent. There's no statistical difference between white mothers and black mothers and Asian mothers and Hispanic mothers. Mothers will go where their kids are being nurtured every day of the week. So we got that problem figured out. Now I'm going to finish this in about five minutes. Um, this is where the story takes another interesting turn. Before I got real fancy with my little PowerPoint, I actually had slides in a box with duct tape on the corner and a slide projector. <laughs> and I got called out to a place called the Silicon Valley so I showed up with my slide projector, and these people looked at me like I was from Pluto, man. <laughs> well, that's cool. I blew off the dust, plugged in my slide projector, did a little story, worked out pretty good. And this lady came out of the audience, she said, man, that was a heck of a story. My only criticism is your computers are getting a little dated. Well, I ain't no high tech guy. They all look about the same to me. I said, well, what do you do for a living? She said, oh, I help run a company called Hewlett Packard. I said, well, my dear, there's an instantaneous solution to this problem. The long and short of it is we've got a million bucks from HP and a systems engineer to go with it. And I now have one of the hippest digital imaging centers east of the Mississippi River, courtesy of HP and Steelcase. But I keep this slide in here for nostalgia reasons, and you never know when an Apple representative might be in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> this is the imaging center that we built, and we're putting kids into the Rhode Island School of Design right out of the imaging center. Uh, we also built a music hall. I stuck a music hall in the north end of the building. Very glad I did, because a guy named Dizzy Gillespie showed up. He's a trumpet player. And I said to Mr. Gillespie, why would you come to a black school in the middle of the inner city that doesn't even have a reputation in music? He said, Billy Taylor told me a black guy built it. I didn't believe one to see for myself. 
and you're too young to appreciate what you build here, man. But I'm not. And you ought to build one of these things in every city in America, and I'm going to help you do it. So Dizzy became a friend. Then the Basie Band showed up, and Herbie Hancock, and Piquita de Rivera, and so forth. Nancy Wilson, Shirley Horn, Betty Carter. I now have 600 recordings. The hippest collection of jazz recordings in the world is in my center in Pittsburgh. We've won four Grammys, nominated nine times. We have the highest win rate of any record company in the world, and we have our own record label. MCG Jazz is now in the record business. There's the place all filled up with rich people on opening night. <laughs> if you'd have dropped a bomb in that room, to wipe all the money in Pennsylvania because it was all sitting there. <laughs> Including my mother and father who were actually on the left-hand side. They're both now deceased, but they lived long enough to see their kid open up the center and open it up black tie in the neighborhood. The next night, they had the neighborhood come in, same food both nights. Why? I wanted to establish the principle that you don't have to have a tuxedo on to be treated like a world-class citizen. And I knew that people start talking about that. So we now sell it all of our concerts in subscription three weeks after the season's announced. There's Dizzy. That's Billy Taylor and, and uh, Jerry Mulligan. Pat Metheny, Jim Hall. Their album made the top 10. Paul Simon's engineers designed this acoustically perfect recording space. And Nancy Wilson won her last two Grammys with us. She got one with RCA and two with us. So basically, we become Nancy's recording company. These are kids from the Pittsburgh Public Schools. Every third grader comes over for a jazz concert when they reach third grade. The problem is, after the concert, which they love and are excited about, they have to go back to school. So they go from elated to depressed. I'd like to propose a new concept. Why don't we start building schools that kids want to be at? And you can solve your problem, because if they don't want to be there, you're not teaching them anything. And this was burned out during the riots. I had to look at that going to school every day. So I had another cardboard box put up the streets. Built a medical technology building, makes money. I get downtown rental rates on the north side of Pittsburgh. University of Pittsburgh Medical Center is one of our partners. This is the Citizens Bank's in there. This is my view of how you're supposed to build buildings in the middle of the inner city. Uh, this won an architectural award. Oh, and them flowers, they're not plastic either. Those are real. Those are called orchids. And the reason I have them in my building was I grew them in that greenhouse. I built a 40,000 square foot greenhouse next to my training center, and I have the welfare moms growing phalaenopsis orchids 15 minutes from this college. And we're selling them in grocery stores. Giant Eagle and Whole Foods buy them. We're starting to generate some revenue. And the reason we got into it, I discovered that orchids are part of the cure for spiritual cancer. And we also won first and second prize in the Orchid Society Symposium. Now, at the end of the day, the worst thing about poor is that it kills your spirit. One of our African-American graduates at the graduation came up to me, teared in her eyes. She said, thank you for saving my life. I said, well, how did I save your life? She said, well, I got enrolled in this horticultural program. I got trained. I got a job. But more importantly, when we went on a field trip to Canada and crossed the border, they called me ma'am for the first time in recent memory. I got my dignity back, thanks to you. Well, later on in the evening, she was over in the corner talking to this white lady. And I'm very photographic, and I said, there's the answer, man. You know what they were talking about? Not poverty and not race. They were talking about orchids. I said, we have to change the conversation and get this thing embracing life and not death, and we can get home. We're also growing tomatoes, those kind. <laughs> now, your homework assignment is check out the prices at the grocery store tonight, and you'll see exactly why I'm growing these next. <laughs> Three ninety nine a pound because I check every day. <laughs> and now I'm down to the end of the story. This is where the story takes another interesting turn. Remember I was out there at Silicon Valley with my little slide projector? Well, this kid come out of the audience, he said, man, that was a heck of a presentation. I said, thanks, man. What do you do for a living? He said, oh, I helped build a company called eBay. I said, oh, that's cool. You got a card? Remember, I had the techie guy. I didn't know what eBay was. So I put the kid's card in my pocket and I went back to Pittsburgh, asked one of the little techie kids, I said, what is eBay, man? He said, Mr. Strickland, that's the Electronic Commerce Network. I said, holy smokes, I met the guy that built the company. So I called him up and I said, Mr. Skull, I've come to have a much deeper appreciation of who you are, man. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I thought you'd figure it out sooner or later. You're really on to something. Here's 500,000 bucks. I said, what's that for? He says, your first replication. Against all probability, Jeff Skull and I have become very close friends. The kid's got $5 billion. He built eBay, 
and he's one of my closest friends. And I was sitting in his mansion in the Silicon Valley, Palo Alto. I said, Jeff, what do you need me for, man? You got five billion bucks. What do you need with a black guy from Pittsburgh for with one program? He said, during your whole presentation, it was only one word that kept popping into my head. I said, what was that? He said, scalable. I think you're eBay on the social side. So I'm going to stick around and see if I'm right. So he gave me some money. We hired a couple of consultants. We wrote a business plan, how to go to scale. We're starting to build centers. We got three centers open. Cincinnati, Grand Rapids, and Frisco. There's the space. There's Jeff on the right, Mr. eBay, the director, Billy Wong, and the kids are doing digital imaging. This is the one that's open in Cincinnati, called the Cincinnati Center for Arts and Technology. They're not franchises. They're affiliates. It's an affiliate model. There's the space. Oh, we cut the dropout rate to 8% with the kids in Cincinnati, with a school system with 50% dropout rate, same kids. This is the digital imaging space, the training techs for Toyota, and this is the newest one. This is in Grand Rapids. I was doing a little slideshow, and this guy from an outfit called Steelcase, their furniture company, was in the audience. He said, man, that's a great story. He flew to Pittsburgh. He said, this is even better than the slides. My only criticism is your furniture is getting a little dated. I said, well, the last time I heard about Steelcase in the furniture business, we can solve that problem. So they gave us $500,000 worth of furniture, re-engineered my whole building. So in exchange for that, they get a slide in my slideshow. <laughs> it now costs $500,000 to get a slide in my slideshow. <laughs> and this is the space we built for poor people in Grand Rapids. Doug DeVos from Amway. This thing looks like the Starship Enterprise. <laughs> Deliberately. Because this is how you're supposed to treat your kids, guys. This is what a school's supposed to look like. graphics. And these are some of the students. One of the ways that we know that the program is taking effect is their pants start to come up. <laughs> uh, and when, I, when they got a belt on, I know I got them. <laughs> and these are the cities that are now in planning. Uh, Cleveland, Columbus, New Orleans, and Philly. And Austin, Texas, New Haven, Minneapolis. Uh, I've met a fellow named Michael Dell. He runs this outfit called Dell Computers. And I showed him a slide. He said, that's a great story. I want one in Austin. So Michael's backing us in Austin. So we've got eight now in planning. Inclu include Halifax, Nova Scotia. We've just signed Halifax. I think we're going to sign Limerick, Air Ireland in April. Uh, we're in Israel. Uh, we're probably going to do something in the Galilee, which will get me back on campus because I want to talk to CMU about that strategy. We're, we want to work with you guys there. And we've got a nibble from Vancouver, and we've got one from Kyoto, Japan. Now, let me tell you about the end of this story. The first thing is, um, you should know, I got a book out it's called Make the Impossible Possible. The book is done by Doubleday, Random House. And the way I got the book is, Inc. Magazine did a story on me. My 15 seconds of fame I was on every newsstand in America. And a guy from New York called me up and said, man, that was a heck of a story. I'm a book broker. You got a number one book in you. I said, well, that's cool. I don't have any money. He said, well, I'm going to come to Pittsburgh and check you out anyway. So he came. I gave him the speech, gave him the lunch. He said, there's a big book here, man. I said, all right, now what? He says, well, I'm going to write a concept up. I'm going to send it to the top seven publishers in New York. Don't get your hopes up. I think I can get one of them at least to interview you. I said, well, I'm, I got a cool life with it without a book. No problem. Well, he called me up. He sent it out on Friday. He called me on Tuesday. He said, four of the seven want to meet you in New York right now. So I did my version of an IPO. I started with Doubleday at ten, uh, 8, Crown at tw 10, Penguin at 12, and I was back at Doubleday at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Now, I'm a salesman, and I know when I got a sale going. I walked in, and the president and all the executive vice presidents were standing at attention before my butt hit the seat. I said, hmm, this is going to be very interesting. So I sat down, and the president of Doubleday said, we're prepared to give you a preemptive bid on the book. I turned to Boswell and said, what's that? He said, take it. That's what that is. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, I, I accept your offer uh, with one provision. I picked the writer. Now, here's where the story becomes spiritual. The writer's from Pittsburgh. The guy lives in Mount Lebanon. And Doubleday recommended I talk to this dude, so he came over to my center I said, well, what makes you such a big shot with Doubleday? He said, I wrote a book called Miracle in the Andes, which is about a rugby team that crashed the mountains of Chile. Well, Vince Rouse, who lives in Mount Lebanon, wrote the book, and it got to be on the New York Times bestseller list. 
I said, well, I want one of them New York Times bestsellers too, man. Are you the guy to get me there? He said, maybe. Why is that so important to you? I said, because it gets me on Oprah. <laughs> and if I get on Oprah and she realizes I'm the guy that built the school in Pittsburgh, looks just like that school she built in Africa, now we can get down to cases. Because what I want to do is build 200 of these things right now. That's enough. The country has been drifting in the wrong direction. This makes no sense. And if I think I can pull, I, I was on Tavis Smiley last weekend, and Oprah's people watch Tavis very carefully. And I, I understand that Charlie Rose has gotten interested. I may have a shot at getting on Oprah, and I want to build centers. And I think she'll get it. And I think she'll get it to the extent that her friend, the President of the United States, will get it. And then I think we could have a heck of a conversation. Part of the reason I'm here today is to recruit you guys to help save our country. What you're learning at Tepper is part of the strategy to save the country because your entrepreneurial spirit, your left brain, right brain, is exactly the antidote that the president was talking about in his speech yesterday. And it's something that I believe in very deeply. So I'm very honored to be here today to talk with you. And thank you for listening to what I had to say today. knows me said that we've got to sit together. Yeah. It's come up three times in the last three weeks. Uh, so I, I want to do that. But sure, you can see where we're going with horticulture and controlled ag is a half a step away from what Van Jones is talking about. We may have our first opportunity to do that in Detroit, uh, where we are talking about building a controlled ag facility, start growing food in the inner city. So we're, we're not far from you. Um, the other thing, of course, is energy. You guys are doing a lot of work on this campus about renewable energy. There's a connection there. You know, wind, solar, and so forth. We, those are all part of this vocabulary. And uh, so we want to be right in the middle of that conversation, in addition to the training programs that will go with creating that new technology. So it's all a big closed circle, so it should make sense. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Between the students who are in your program and the public school system, and whether or not the state uh, holds them accountable in the same way that it does other students who remain uh, in the public school system. And if you would mind, uh, tell us something about since you're moving across the country, what kinds of political environment issues are uh, affecting your ability to replicate these types of operations? That you good, both good questions. We actually, believe it or not, have a cooperative relationship with our public school system. I am a believer in public education. I don't think this country can make it if we don't solve the public education system problem. So I'm an advocate for public education. I happen to be an advocate for this system. But we have to change the outcomes. We can't have kids walk in the street with diplomas that they can't read, man. So we're a part of the solution, not part of the problem. Um, the problem with the whole system is when you exempt people from performance metrics, you don't get good performance. So the kids can't read. You know, the school system gets the same amount of money they got last year as they did this year. So you take performance measurements out of it, you compromise the integrity of the process, in my view. Number two, we're, we, you know, from time to time, we uh, get resistance from local politicians who say, we don't need Strickland, He's, you know, we got this thing all figured out, which is fine, I'll go to the next town. But it's not a franchise, so I'm not moving to Philadelphia and I'm not moving to Charlotte. It's a local program run by local people. The key is to have it grow organically in that community. Now, they're all going to be tied to together in a network of affiliates because they want to go get a bill passed in Congress. 
to fund these things as partnerships with public school systems. And I would not bet against it. I think we got a shot at pulling this off because I think that everything that Obama's talking about is what I just talked about today. And I think if we can line this thing up, we can really get going in a pretty interesting way pretty quickly. Um, the other thing is I keep telling people locally, look, there are enough poor people to go around for everybody, man. Nobody's got a lock on the market. Uh, <laughs> You know, it's cool. I'll get 20 and you get 30 and everybody will be fine. We can raise the water level for everybody. And that's really the strategy that we're trying to employ. And the even better news is I'll stay in Pittsburgh where I belong, so I ain't moving to Cincinnati or Detroit. I'll stay right on the north side, but you can run the world from the north side, in my view, at least. Maybe one or two more. Yes, sir. It seems like you're trying to suggest that the schools that you're setting up should be the model for how public schools should be run in the future. But giving the administrator the systematic way that public schools have been running for decades, what do you think would have to change fundamentally about the system to effectively execute the model? The, the governance structure. Yeah, got to get the governance structure changed. If I were running a school system, I'd break it up. And I'd have each school run as an independent operating unit, okay, with a headmaster, like, you know, a guy like me running the place, with a board made up of local people who run the place, and a faculty, and, and they could be union people, that's cool, but they have to be accountable for performance, man. You gotta be able to say at the end of the year, you did this, you didn't do that, you met your goals, you didn't meet your goals. Guess what? Most of y'all, when you get out of the Tepper School, are gonna go to employers who are very interested in performance outcomes and metrics, believe me. So why we can do it in the for-profit world and exempt the not-for-profit world, doesn't, that makes no sense to me. So what I'm suggesting is we change the governance structure, make every school accountable for its performance. My daughter goes to a little fancy school called Ellis School for Girls here in Pittsburgh, and it's a wonderful place, and they're great at nurturing young women. They have a fabulous track record. And guess what? If the headmaster comes to the parent meeting and says, you know, we had a bad year, and 40% of your kids didn't graduate, do you have any idea how long that headmaster would last in that job? would be just about long enough for her to clear out her desk. And we'll get another headmaster who has a different view of education, right? Well, we accept that performance standard in the public school system. Forget it, man. You'll never make it. So we've got to separate these things and operate them as independent operating units. And I believe you can solve your problem. And I think you can do it with unions. I don't think it's about unions. I think it's about measurement and performance and bring the metrics of the for-profit world into this conversation with not-for-profits I think we can get a little closer home to this thing. But I am for public education, but I'm not for the way it's going now because that's not going to work. Yes? You talked about how environment uh, strongly affects the people in the community. Um, and through your music and your arts program and technology programs, have you found that parents, I think that parents have a strong influence on children in your environment. Have you found that they change the perspective some have because they become advocates for the kids now because they know that if the kids enroll in our arts program they have a 90 percent chance of going to college based on history so they tend to support their kids now they're not conver converts uh, etc although we do get some parents who come to drop the kids off in the arts program can't help but see the vocational school and sometimes will enroll in it get trained and get a job so that has happened if we were to really do this on a system-wide basis, we'd have to recruit a very different group of people to kind of dig down into the sociology of this. But I believe we can do it. I'm an, I think we could solve this thing. And I'm not talking about your kids, I'm talking about now, man. I think with the momentum of the president and some right-thinking people like you guys, I think we could organize this country and solve this stuff. And I don't think we're talking about 20 years. I think we could do it in half that time. But we've got to get on with it because we're late in the game. We can't continue like this. And we're now at the crisis level, which is exactly maybe the time that you get people seriously engaged. I'm not going anywhere. I'm in this thing for the rest of my life. I'd like some of you guys to join me. Now, always being a salesman, um, uh, Look on our website, you'll see all the opportunities for jazz concerts. You ought to come buy a ticket, uh, buy the book because it's a cool book. And every time you do, my little rating on Amazon goes up a half a tick. And, and Oprah's people watch that too. 
<laughs> but aside from all of that, um, this is really cool to be able to meet you guys because you give me back something that's really important. You believe in the work I'm doing, which I make look easy because that's my job. But a lot of times you're flying in the face of a hurricane. But when you're out with people who kind of let you know you're doing all right, it gives you enough uh, energy and recommitment to go back and do your job. So it's been a very nice way to spend the day. Thanks. Thank you.